morning worship services. I want to welcome everyone, especially those that might be visiting. If you are visiting, please take a card from the pew in front of you and fill it out so we could have a record of your attendance. A reminder to turn off cell phones. I have lots of announcements, so I'm going to go through them very quickly. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be seeing at the back. You can ask later or ask the appropriate person. I want to remember our missionary work that we support. Lots of upcoming uh, events on the 31st, which I believe is this Tuesday, at the Frishes on Turfway is Ladies' Breakfast at 10 a.m. See Debbie if you have any questions. Next Sunday, we will be doing a, a meal, fellowship meal afterwards, after our uh, morning services, and we'll get back together for another worship at 1 o'clock. Uh, it is a carry-in. Please bring food. If you have any questions about that, see me. Uh, I'll help out with the menu. Uh, on the Monday after that, the next day, is breakfast at the Lease family. Uh, traditional Labor Day breakfast at 9 a.m. If you have any questions, see Jerry or Jennifer. On the 11th, we have our Dinosaur Day with Jeff Miller from Apologetics Press. And there's more details, and there's a, a, a flyer in the lobby for that. And invite your friends and family to that. We also have a, a picture you can put on Facebook to remind people. Also, then, following uh, services on the uh, 12th, uh, we will have uh, Jeff from Apologetics Press will still be here and talk, teaching a teacher's workshop and have some question and answers after the Sunday or Saturday meeting. If you have any questions about the teacher's workshop, see Jonathan Glass. Uh, that's, we're spending time and effort on that. It's not only for those that teaching, but those that may teach in the future, so it would be great to uh, be a part of that. We have a CW, CCW class uh, coming up. Uh, see Dick Woodard on that. It's uh, $55, I think it's 10 o'clock, what time, is, what day is it, do you know? It's coming up, just see Dick on that, I don't have the notes here, the time. Uh, sign up sheet for communion prep, uh, we still need someone for September, November, and December. We have our fall gospel meeting with Phil Sanders in Search of the Lord's Way, October 15th through the 17th. We'll be talking about social and cultural issues. And then also we are working on our planning meeting for uh, 2022, so I want to pray about that. If you have any suggestions for what we're doing here, please get it to the appropriate deacon or one of the elders. Those that are sick and lost loved ones, Larry Beckley, uh, who was a member here, his brother James Beckley of Lakeland, Florida, passed away this week. Savannah Rittenhouse continues to have a lot of ongoing health concerns. Ron Stewart had a stroke, and I think it's a little bit more serious than initially thought. Uh, one of his arms is paralyzed, so he's going through rehab, so I want to remember him in our prayers. Uh, also, uh, Lily has a cyst on her leg, and she's seeing a doctor tomorrow. That's why she's not here uh, this morning. I want to remember David Pugh's mother, uh, Anne. Sonny's Pew's mother uh, is having health problems also. Frank and Judy, also the Hackers, Lynx, Al Rohner. Carl and Vicki, it's great to see them here. We have a card from them that says, Thanks for the cards, prayers, while well, Carl and I have been through tough times. We much, much appreciate all of your Christian love sent to us, Carl and Vicki Shreve. So thank you. Uh, I want to remember uh, Cheryl Piles. Also, Bill McLaren uh, had a fall at Frisch's at the men's breakfast. Uh, I think the exercise was too much, so he's at home uh, sore, so I want to remember him in our prayers. Uh, all the students that are traveling, especially Greg and Allison, uh, that are overseas. And then uh, Betty Kelly's sister, Jean Nelson, fell again, and she had already had a fractured hip, so I want to remember her in our prayers. Uh, She's 94, so any time that you fall and at that age is a, a challenge for your health. I want to pray for the family of Dave Mosser. Uh, Dave passed away. He's friends of uh, Jerry and Jennifer. Uh, and pray for his wife, Mary Jane. 
and then Terry Wright, who's a uh, friend of uh, a friend of uh, trying to think who it's Sandy's friend, but Sandy's friend of a friend, right? So uh, he had an operation on, or scheduled for the 13th, and if that doesn't go well, he'll have open heart surgery. So I want to remember him in our prayers. That's all of our announcements I have. Let's begin our worship with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we come before you so thankful for this time that we have to meet here with your family. We, we pray that as we enter into this time of worship that we'll be encouraging to one another, that our worship will be uplifting, that we will do things and say things in a way that is pleasing to you. We pray that you be with Brian as he delivers the message, that he'll speak boldly in love from your word. We pray that if there's someone here that is working on making changes in their life or is struggling with things that are going on or needs to make a commitment to you or renew that commitment to you, that they will have the strength, courage, and humility to do that uh, this morning. We pray that you be with us as a family and the work that goes on here. Uh, continue to bless us and continue to give us the heart to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this opportunity to assemble together and to lift up songs of praise to you. We humble our hearts and we purify our hearts before you, our God and our creator. And we recognize, uh, we recognize that you are deserving of all praise and of all honor. And we recognize that without Jesus, we have no right to come before you this morning. We recognize that we are blessed beyond what we deserve. We know that all good things in this life are gifts from you. But we are thankful chiefly, Father, for your grace and for your love and for your mercy. We are thankful for those who are willing to submit their, themselves to your will, that your grace is more than sufficient to draw us back into a relationship with you. And we are grateful, Father, that, that Jesus gave all on our behalf on the cross so that we might be called your children. We pray, Father, that you would help us not to take that for granted. Father, we are mindful of the fact that you are all-powerful and all-knowing and that you are directly present in the lives of your people. And we are grateful, Father, that, that you hear our prayers. And we pray, Father, that you would bring healing upon those who were mentioned this morning who were suffering from various ailments and we pray, Father, that you would be with the medical staffs that are tending to them, and we pray, Father, that they would receive the best care possible and that you would bring healing. We are also mindful of those who are hurting because they have lost loved ones. And we pray, Father, that you would bring peace and comfort to those of your people. And we are mindful, Father, of the, of the families that are gathering on a tarmac in Dover to receive the remains of their fallen loved ones, of our fellow Americans who have given their lives in service to their country. And we pray, Father, that you would bring peace and comfort to them as well. We pray, Father, that, that you would be with those who are uh, in difficult positions around the world we're so grateful for our liberty and our freedom to assemble here this morning in peace, but we recognize that it's not that way everywhere. And we pray, Father, that you would give courage and strength to those who are trying to do what is right and in accordance with your will in countries where the same freedoms and liberties don't exist. We pray, Father, that you would grant them faith and courage and in the face of tremendous oppression. Father, we are mindful of our young people and the, those who are overseas and those who have gone back to college in other states and those who are walking the hallways of local uh, educational institutions. And we pray, Father, that you would grant them the courage and the strength to stand up for what is right and to, to remain faithful we are thankful for the teaching that they've received here in this body, and we pray, Father, that they would remain true to your word and remain faithful. Father, as we continue in this hour of worship, we pray, Father, that you, again, receive the glory and the, the praise and the honor that you deserve as our creator and our king. We pray, Father, that you would forgive us where we have sinned against you. We're so grateful for Jesus and um, his blood that was shed on our behalf that, again, grants us this avenue of prayer to you, our God. Through Jesus, we ask it. Amen.
morning's scripture reading will be taken from Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Again, that is Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 140,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, they sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that the song except the 144,000 and who were redeemed from the earth. These were the ones who were not defiled with women, and for they were virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb where he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being f- first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And they were, in their mouth was found no deceit, for when they were without fault before the throne of God. As Gavin started reading, I realized I forgot my glasses. So I had to go get my glasses. And thank you, Gavin, for taking your time. I uh, appreciate all these men, and Gavin, for leading us, leading us in that scripture reading. Marty, thank you so much for leading us in our singing this morning as well. Thank you for that prayer a few minutes ago, Derek. That was, that was great. Look at this text here in front of you, Revelation 14 and verse 5, where the Apostle John simply wrote, And in their mouth was found no deceit. For they are without fault before the throne of God. The first part of this verse seems to be, appears to be, taken from the book, from the prophet Zephaniah. It is the only place in the New Testament where Zephaniah is quoted. I plan to come back to that a little bit later. Many of us have probably never heard a sermon on the book of Zephaniah. Perhaps you have. Perhaps you have not, but it has a strong message for our time. It belongs to the Old Testament, of course, in a section of our Bibles that we call the Minor Prophets, not because they were unimportant, not because they were less significant, but because really for this reason only, they are relatively brief. The book of Zephaniah has but three chapters and 53 verses. Its primary theme is the day of the Lord, a phrase that occurs about seven times. Zephaniah wastes no time in announcing disaster for the world and for God's unfaithful people. In Zephaniah chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, if you'll find the book of Zephaniah in your Bibles, please. Zephaniah chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. Listen to the language. Listen to the power of this language. I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place, the names of the idolatrous priests with the, with the pagan priests, those who worship the hosts of heaven on the housetops, those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcom, that would be an Ammonite god, Those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of Him. Now before we go any further, we're going to do, we're going to appreciate if we can some of the background of this book. Just briefly, of first importance is this, who exactly is Zephaniah? Nothing in the scriptures are going to tell us much more than this. Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 1. The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Four generations are mentioned here in this verse, making this the longest written line of descent 
of any of the prophets of the Old Testament. Taking us all the way back to Hezekiah, king of Judah. And so his heritage actually taps into the very lineage of Christ himself. Zephaniah was familiar with Jerusalem. He was familiar with the corruption of her princes and of her priests who he denounces. The meaning of the name Zephaniah is somewhat disputed. It can mean Jehovah protects, which would likely make it a name given to him by his father and mother in honor of the Lord. The Lord protects us. The Lord protects his people. Or the name can mean Jehovah lies in wait, like a panther lying in wait for its prey. Like all the prophets, Zephaniah had his own message, his own emphasis, given to him by the Lord. Following the death of King Hezekiah in 690 BC, Judah came under the reign of his son Manasseh, who reigned a whopping 55 years. Manasseh made evil popular again by rebuilding the high places to the Baals, even setting up an image to Baal in the house of God itself. And because he did this, and because the people followed him, the Lord promised to punish Judah severely. Now eventually, at the end of his life, Manasseh repented of his evil, but he was never able to turn the people completely back to God, which is a lesson there for us. Be careful about your influence. You may lead others, perhaps thousands, millions of others down the wrong path. And you yourself may repent and turn back to God, but the influence that you've had on others, perhaps they never repent and they never come back to the Lord. After Manasseh died, his son Amon became king of Judah, but for only two years he was murdered by his servants. After this, Josiah, the son of Amon, became ruler when he was only, get this, eight years old. Can you imagine having a king who is only eight years old? But even as a young man, Josiah was righteous before the Lord. He broke down, he destroyed the altars that were built in the days of Manasseh and, and Amon. Josiah's 31-year reign over Judah from 640 to about 609 B.C. can be divided into two parts, separated by his reforms in about 621 B.C. Josiah would be, it turns out, the last of the good kings of Judah. You can read about him in 2 Kings chapter 22 through 23 and 2 Chronicles chapter 34 through 35. In spite of all of Josiah's reforms, and although the king was faithful to God himself, the Lord did not turn away from the fierceness of his wrath that he was going to bring toward Judah, according to 2 Kings 23 and verse 26. The question is why? Because I thought that we served a God of second chances. Why didn't God cancel the calamity that he promised to bring on Judah? Because for all of Josiah's reforms, the hearts of the people did not return to the Lord. Not to make excuses in any way for leaders and especially for church leaders, for leaders of God's people today. But leaders cannot take the people where the people do not want to go. So Zephaniah served as a prophet in the days of Josiah, king of Judah. His words were heavy, they were critical and they were full of, a, of warning and alarm against Judah. Let's turn to the contents of the book of Zephaniah. What can we discern from the text itself? I'm going to divide the book into three parts, not necessarily keeping to the chapters, but I'm going to divide it into three parts and give a summary of each part. A summary of chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 13 exposes the harsh reality of a coming conflagration. 
where the Lord said, I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. The tone of this reminds us of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 19. The target of this divine punishment is clearly spelled out in verse 4. Judah and Jerusalem. And then more specificity is given here that the target of God's wrath is the idolatrous priests, those who worship the heavens, those who make blasphemous oaths, those who are complacent, who no longer seek the Lord, those who are princes and king's children who have abused their position. None of their idolatry or riches or false theology or fine clothing will allow them to escape. In fact, the consummation of the Lord's destruction will be as a sacrifice to God, according to verses 7 and 8. God, or or rather, Zephaniah is saying, God is saying through his prophet, you like to sacrifice to the gods so much? Okay, you will have it. You will be the sacrifice. A summary of chapter 1, verse 14, through chapter 3, verse 5, provides us with a frightening description of, of coming attractions. It begins like this in verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. And then it's followed by this in chapter 1, verse 15 and following. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. I will bring distress, excuse me, distress upon men, And they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of His jealousy, for He will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land." There is nothing vague, nothing mysterious, nothing subtle about the meaning of these words. An invitation to repentance is issued to Judah in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O undesirable nation. Before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld His justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility in the day of the Lord's anger. While His listeners, while His readers considered the prospect of of repentance, Zephaniah gives them an illustration, a needed illustration of God's fierceness against the surrounding nations and peoples in the remainder of chapter 2. All these nations threatened Judah. All of those surrounding nations had turned away from the Lord. So, Zephaniah says, the day of the Lord will come terribly upon those lands and upon those peoples. But what about Judah? What about Jerusalem? Oh, the prophet has not forgotten the point of his prophecy. He turns his attention back to Jerusalem and pronounces a stern woe to her princes and prophets and priests and judges who have committed treachery and violence and and pollution, sexual and moral and spiritual pollution. Among his people, the Lord is righteous and the unjust knows no shame. Chapter 3 and verse 5. A summary of chapter 3 verse 6 to the end of the book in verse 20 presents to us the most hopeful part of the book of Zephaniah. 
You remember that invitation to repentance that I just read in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3? The Lord, the Lord knows what's in man. The Lord is not holding his breath in expectation of a favorable response. His people ignored all of those warnings and even rose up early, the text says, to engage in, in more corruption. Chapter 3 and verse 7. So here's what the Lord is going to do. It's not going to be pretty. Chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. In other words, this is like the Lord saying, you just wait. You just wait. Until the day I rise up for plunder, my determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Wow, plain enough. All the nations, including Judah and Jerusalem, will come to know the fierce anger of the Lord and the Lord will not be turned back. Here's what's going to happen. God will use the armies of Babylon to lay waste the nations and bring Judah into subjection for 70 years. According to Jeremiah 25, verses 8 through 11. Also, the same thing is said in Jeremiah chapter 29. It's very specific. You will be in Babylon. You will be in captivity for 70 years. But the Lord's ultimate plan for his people and his kingdom will not be denied. Verses 9 through 20. The Lord will not forsake his people altogether. In the future, a remnant of his people will speak language that is pure. They will call on the name of the Lord. They will serve the Lord in unity. They will be true worshipers. They will be meek and, and humble people. He was speaking of the remnant, the small group of those Jews who would return to their homeland after the Babylonian captivity is complete. All of this was a precursor to God's ultimate plan. Someday, about 600 years into the future, a remnant of all the nations would come together in the Messianic kingdom Better days lay ahead. Look at verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God is in your, in your midst. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Zephaniah, God's prophet, was sure of the things he was saying. Like two bookends, his book began and ended with the same important prophetic note. Says the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 2, and chapter 3, verse 20. All of his threatenings and grace were according to the word of the Lord. Of course, you and me, as I recognize as I'm preaching the sermon this morning, we are far removed from the days of Zephaniah and the prophets. Many, many hundreds of years removed. But hopefully not so far removed that this book cannot contribute to our spiritual maturity. Each of the prophets of old had their own unique role in God's plan. Zephaniah's message was not extraordinarily different from that of the other prophets. But timing also matters. His message was one of the last, if not the last, prophetic disturbance before the day of the Lord finally arrived, only about 15 or 20 years later. His message was short. It was succinct. And it was a serious call to repentance. Unfortunately, the call went unheeded. So here are a few takeaways from the book of Zephaniah for you and me today. The Lord wants to be known as a God who inspects his people. 
He wants to be known as a God who judges his people. The Lord wants to be known in this way. Here's how we know. Because he depicts himself in exactly this way throughout the scriptures from beginning to end. In his judgment of Adam and Eve. In his judgment of the world in the time of the flood. In his judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. In his judgment of Moses in not letting him enter into the promised land. In his judgment of Nineveh and Babylon and Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And then later on, hundreds of years later, by the Romans. In his judgment of the Pharisees and and, and Sadducees. Remember those stern rebukes by Jesus? Those were judgment voices in his coming judgment of the whole world. I recognize, as you do, that the Lord is many things in relationship to us. He's our creator. He's our guide. He's our father. He's our savior. He's our king. He was the friend of Abraham. And isn't it the teaching of the New Testament that he longs to be your friend as well? One of the most important things he is, is our judge and our auditor. The writer of Hebrews describes you and me as coming to salvation and to God, the judge of all. Hebrews 12, verse 23. It was important for Zephaniah to persuade Judah to think of God in precisely this manner as their great judge to whom they would one day stand before him and give an account of their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not only theologically correct, it is the realization that God is your judge and your auditor. This is the realization that will transform your life and ultimately save your soul. You will be, can I say it like this? You will be more thoroughly saved if you fear the judge who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10 and verse 28. For Judah, reform was too late. Reform was way too late. Their punishment, their captivity was absolutely certain. For you and me, There's time. There's time. God is our judge. He is our judge in punishment. He is our judge in grace. And it is up to us to choose. He judges the nations. He judges churches. He judges people and individuals. He judges you and me. There is, there can be, but one wise reply. It's announced by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. You hear that? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we need to repent. We need to repent of our sins before the great judge, before the coming of the final judgment. Now, let's not remove ourselves from this talk of divine judgment just yet, because there is a second thought I I want you to consider from the book of Zephaniah. Salvation comes in small sizes. Salvation comes in small sizes. Here's what I mean by that. Whatever population of souls is under consideration again and again in the Scriptures, it is always rare. It is rare for everyone to be saved within that population. In the case of Judah, in the days of Josiah, in the days of Zephaniah, the hammer of divine judgment was going to be swift. It was going to be hard for the majority of that population. It was a foreboding time for that nation as her captivity drew ever closer. The keynote of the prophet's message was doom and gloom. Doom and gloom. Words like consume and cut off and punish and crashing and distress and riddance. These were the terms the Spirit directed the prophet to use. God's holiness. God's holiness was reacting hard against idolatry, against sin, against indifference of every kind. All of Judah was guilty. Nevertheless, there was this silver lining of hope. 
for that nation. A remnant, a small group, a, a handful of Judah would ultimately be spared. A small company of, of humble, truth-loving people would survive beyond that day. In fact, in fact, it was for the expectation of the remnant and the coming of Christ later that Judah was to be spared at all, which is why Zephaniah chapter 3 is so important. It is a reminder to all of us, to you and to me, that you, you can be among the few who survive the stress of divine judgment. Abraham, you remember in the book of Genesis, he bartered for only ten righteous souls to be spared. The fire that came down from upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Not ten righteous souls could be spared, could be saved. Only eight souls were saved in the great flood. Some, a few, would not defile their garments and, and, to escape the, the Lord's censor against the church at Sardis. Remember what's said about those few? They refused to defile their garments. And who can forget the words of Jesus, the powerful words of Jesus in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter in by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are, few, there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few, there are few who find it. Judgment is coming, of that there can be no doubt. America will have her day in divine court. The church of Christ will have her day in the court of heaven. The Point Pleasant Church of Christ. We will stand before the God of heaven. Who will be able to stand? The righteous. The righteous will stand. And you, my friend, you can be in that number if you will only travel the narrow road and walk in humility before God and turn away from evil, Romans 12, verse 21, and bow before no idol and keep a, keep a clear head and a clear conscience, 1 Peter 1 and verse 13. Another lesson to be learned. God expects his people to seek and inquire of him. In fact, he expects all of us to seek him. This is not merely an invitation, it is an expectation. The Lord has scattered the nations so that people should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. Acts 17, verse 27, so many people fail at this point. They fail to actively seek after the Lord. And that will ultimately be their undoing. Zephaniah promised blessings to the people in chapter 2, verse 3. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld His justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. While all men should seek the Lord, obviously, this is especially the case for God's people, the church of Christ. If anyone should be seeking the Lord, it should be us. It should be you and me. This is where Judah went wrong. This is where God's people under the old covenant went wrong. They did not seek the Lord. And this is where we go wrong as well. Our own spiritual vitality can be distinctly and accurately measured in proportion to our desire and our discipline to seek the Lord. I implore you this morning, make this the measure of your life. Measure it in your personal Bible study. That, that surely measures something. Measure it in your prayer life. Measure it in your evangelistic zeal and in your moral choices. Every day He calls you to do but one thing. Seek the Lord with all your heart. That's all you need to do. What about this lesson? Do not trust in uncertain riches or position against the day of the Lord. Do we really have to say this? I guess, I guess we do. Zephaniah and all the prophets said the same thing, and it remains true today. Nothing in this world can give you security against the judgment of God. Nothing. And it's foolish to even try. To make us think, you remember, the, the Lord, and, and, this, and that was the design of, of his teaching, of telling the story, to make us think. 
The Lord called a certain rich man a fool because he trusted in all of his wealth and all of his ingathering, not knowing that his soul would be required of him that very night. Remember in Luke chapter 12? Ladies and gentlemen, life is short and uncertain. Come on, let's be realistic. Let's be realistic this morning. Every soul will be required soon. Nothing withstands the power of death except the power of Christ and our faith in Him. Instead, we should ask, as the psalmist did in Psalm 116, verse 12, what shall I render to the Lord for all of His benefits toward me? Peter advises us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10, verses 11 and 12, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, in other words, because the whole world is going to crumble all around you, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Finally, this morning, although there are many other lessons that we could look at, let's just end with this one. Always remember that the Lord hates idolatry. He hates idolatry. That is the theme behind idolatry. All of this. This divine hatred of idolatry has been authenticated again and again in the scriptures and even codified in the Old and the New Covenants. I know of nothing in my study of the Bible, I know of nothing that stirs up divine wrath as much as idolatry. The Apostle Paul gave us a tragic record of humanity's spiritual and moral decline in Romans chapter 1 and it all began look at it it all began with the rejection of the glory due to the Lord and the substitution of that glory by idolatry Zephaniah was vehement in his rebuke of idolatry and by it he justified the Lord's jealousy in chapter 1, verse 18, and chapter 3, and verse 8. He said, look, you deserve the outpouring of God's wrath because of your idolatrous corruption, your idolatrous ways. Brethren, let me just persuade you, if you'll allow me, this one point, in all of our hobbies, in all of our pursuits in life, let us continually check ourselves. Has this become an idol to me? Has this object, has this interest, has this ideology, has this fascination with whatever is presented to us, has this become a substitute for God in my life? The sin of idolatry is subtle, Involving not merely the worship of statues, that to us is not subtle at all. That's wrong. People do it today all over the world. They bow down before statues made of gold and silver and stone and, and wood. And they do that and we see that and we say, oh, this is an idolatrous people. And, and yes, that is true. But idolatry, the sin of idolatry is also the pursuit of anything in competition with God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. So identify it in your lives and put it to death and turn back to God like the Thessalonians did in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9. They turn from idols, it says, to serve the living and true God. One of the text that I pointed out at the beginning, in fact the first one, was Revelation 14 and verse 5. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. As I said before, the first part of this appears to be taken from Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 13. Again, the only quotation from Zephaniah in the New Testament. It is a description. It is a description of the moral and spiritual characteristics of the future remnant who would be faithful, who would be pleasing to God. And now John 
in his apocalypse, in the book of Revelation, in his use of Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 13, was, was describing the characteristics of those who are reward, rewarded with heaven. Those whom he says in verse 4, Revelation 14, verse 4, who follow the Lamb wherever he goes, they are without fault before the throne of God. Now when we think of the book of Revelation, we think of people being before the throne of God, we, our immediate thought is that we're, we're, we're thinking about, oh, that's, 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 that's heaven, that's a description of heaven. Not necessarily, not necessarily. It is a description of all of us living and dead as we are living our lives on this earth. We are before the throne of God. I mean, the description lends itself to that. Who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. He's not describing people who are in heaven. He's not describing people who have, have died, who are in the graves. He's describing us right now. We are following the Lamb, are we not? Wherever He goes, and we are without fault before the throne of God. That's where I want to be. And that's where you want to be. So let's turn away from the sins that brings the Lord's judgment upon us. And let's turn back to Christ, the Lamb of God, who is ever before us, ready to take away all of our sin. Are you subject to the invitation of Christ? To the gospel invitation, the good news that salvation is available to sinners like all of us. If this is your time, if this is what you have a mind to do, we implore you to come and make that known to us now as we stand and sing this invitation. to five. 
spent a lot of time studying in the book of Matthew lately, uh, as we've seen during the weeks uh, until we've been going through. One of the areas that I, I had focused around and had spent some time in was Matthew 26. I wanted to read a couple of verses from there um, to you and with you. Matthew 26, and beginning in verse 17, you know, the, they're gathered together and they're getting ready to... Um, to participate in the Passover. You know, they've been talking about it now for several verses, which means actually several days. But down in verse 17, Now on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to Him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed, and they prepared the Passover. Now this is something they've been doing for generations. They, they quit doing it for some period of time, and then they went into exile. And there was all kinds of, this, uh, this feast was something that they used to help them remember over and over again how God had delivered them, how God had kept them from death, and how God had saved them as they left Egypt during those ten plagues. They had that feast of the unleavened bread every year. And then we go down into verse 26, verse through 30. And we read and we, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the, till that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You see, these men were gathered around the table. These men were Jews. These men were gathered around remembering deliverance from God from a, from a sure death. And he's saying, this is my new covenant. This is your opportunity to experience a new deliverance. A new escape from death, and that's through Jesus Christ. Our Passover lamb was partaking in the Passover lamb. Jesus was helping them make that move, that transition on to understand that God had done it once and God was going to do it again. And for us, we remember that every week so that we don't forget how much God has delivered us from and the salvation we all have an assurance in. Let's, let's pray. Father God, you have kept us and you have saved us. Father, we're so thankful with grateful hearts. We gather, we gather around this table to look back and think about Christ, uh, the Lamb and the sacrifice, Father, that he made on our behalf. May we, as we partake of this this morning, um, may we look back and think on that event and the ongoing blessings of that in our own lives and examine ourselves as we partake. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Now that we've concluded our moment of observing the sacrifice of Christ, we think about the sacrifice that we make ourselves. We take this time to reflect upon how much God has done for us and how much we could give back and do it with the right attitude and the right heart. Bill? Father, our God in heaven, we're so thankful for this day. This opportunity to come together as a family. Family, Father, knowing that you loved us enough that you bring us together. And Father, we know you have blessed us in so many ways. We all have been blessed with, with good jobs. We've been blessed <clears throat> with family. We've been blessed with uh, one another and support in many different ways. We live in a great country. We live, Father, we <clears throat> are, have this opportunity to worship you in, in spirit and truth. And so many countries, Father, do not have this privilege. And Father, we are a wealthy country. And we're wealthy people, Father, and you have blessed us. So at this time, Father, let's reflect on that and remember that it all comes from you, that you own all things, that you made all things. And if we give back, Father, help us to give generously in a way, Father, that, that you <clears throat> would appreciate us and you would be, uh, we would be able to do more for you and help uh, spread the gospel here in the area and around the world, Father, because there is much need. We pray, Father, that you... Guide us and keep us from harm and danger. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
you have your visitors, if you come back Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and we'll have a devotion and worship again. Um, also, John mentioned that we need this um, September, November, and December sign-ups for communion prepare, and uh, I'd really appreciate if I could get three more signatures for that. Otherwise, if I can, I would do it again, but uh, if you can, uh, I'd really appreciate someone else doing that. Um, let's stand and sing this last song, and then we'll be led in our closing prayer by Steve. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given us this morning to worship you. And we pray, Father, that our worship was pleasing to you, that our singing was a sweet song to you. And Father, we pray that our worship was in spirit and in truth. Now, we thank you for Brian's message, and we ask, Father, that we be able to apply this message to our lives and throughout the, the world that we travel, the week coming up, that we will be, through our influence, a way to change the direction of this country. Now, Father, we ask that you lift up Ron Stewart in the hospital right now with his throat, and we ask, Father, that you give him the healing that he needs if it's in your will. We also ask that you comfort his family, his wife, Bay, in this time of trial that they're going through. Now, Father, if there was someone out there that needs to obey the gospel, we pray that this message this morning will influence them to the point and plant the seed and it will start to sprout, that they will do your will. Father, guide us and protect us throughout this week as we go out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.